Welcome to Story Smack. We have been off for a while, but since so many junkies are locked in for the COVID-19 pandemic, we're bringing it back. And uh, you may notice the sound quality is a little bit off today because we are recording from a secret remote bunker. Of course. With many machine guns and landmines. Oh. We started doing a fun little thing on Facebook Live called Sigler in Place. Uh, just the first one, we read some Jack London, chit-chatted. The second one, we introduced The Wheels of Death, which is our Wheels new of way. Death. Oh, death. Our way of picking movies to review on Story Smack. There's a wheel of time marking the decades and a wheel of genres. We randomize the decade and the genre. Then we have junkies give us movie suggestions for films that are on Netflix. Got to be on Netflix in an effort to not add additional costs for as many of you as we can. There will be more Sigler in Place Facebook Live events in the near future. So if you're not following me or my group over at facebook.com slash Scott Sigler, do that. We'll also try to get them going on Instagram and possibly in the future Twitch. It's just my way of bringing a few rays of sunshine into your COVID cloud. The decade that came up when we spun the wheel of death was the 2010s. The genre was disaster movies. Via the junkie suggestions on that Facebook Live, we settled on the movie 2012. 2012 was actually made in 2008, but hey, since it has 2012 as the title, we felt it worked fine for the 2010s. We knew this movie would be bad. We were warned. We were warned. We were warned this movie would be bad. And the man who warned us it would be bad happens to be our guest on today's Story Smack, Dr. Phil Plate, the Bad Astronomer. Phil is an astronomer, author, and the brain behind the Bad Astronomy blog, currently hosted at SciFi.com. He's an ardent sci-fi fan and has even consulted on sci-fi TV shows, movies, and books, including one or two in the Sigler Vest. He's also a good friend of ours. He can sometimes be found sleeping on Scott's couch during San Diego Comic-Con. Phil, welcome to Story Smack. Thank you, guys. We are uh, thrilled to have you on the show, our our resurgence of Story Smack. And um, you did warn us this was not a good movie. Yeah, yes, you did warn us. How long have we known each other? Scott. <laughs> I mean, a very long time. we met? Yeah, I think so. 15 years? You know how much yeah. I love both of you. True. <laughs> However. Why didn't we trust you, Phil? Why didn't we trust you? I want to be very clear that as much as I love <laughs> you, you have backslid so much oh. that I want to oh. eternally damn your souls to hell for even making oh. me think about this extreme. <laughs> terrible movie again uh but well, i still love you <laughs> we are sorry to dredge up the ghosts of movies past for you but we have some questions <laughs> that only a scientist can answer would you be willing to answer a few questions about the science of 2012 i bet it's only a smart ass scientist and it's easy because <laughs> there is no science in that movie Yay! it's, it's I will- just John Cusack barely escaping a giant crack in the earth following him, no matter where he goes. Yep. They should have made this a supernatural paranormal movie. Then it would have made a lot more sense. Well, I I still think it wouldn't have made any sense. No sense? Okay. Well, Phil, let's get to it. Question number one. Can you explain for both me and for the listeners at home? Uh, Sorry, I'm going to interrupt. Before we do that, anybody who's listening to Story Smack and wants to see 2012 after that discussion... This is your spoiler alert. Thank We're you. going to spoil this. And really, I don't think it's going to make it any worse. Honestly, no, I think no. it might make it better. Good. So you've had your spoiler alert. Now, question number one, <laughs> Phil, help us out. What is a neutrino? Right. Well, a neutrino is a real thing. One of the few things that this movie mentions that actually, you know, can happen. Um, it's a subatomic particle and it, it's, it's a part of the subatomic particle family, just like protons and neutrons and electrons that make up normal matter. You, me, you know, your book collection, that sort of thing. Neutrinos are a little bit different though. They have a little, little teeny tiny bit of mass, but they are extremely uninterested in interacting with normal matter. And what I mean Mm -hmm. is like, you know, a photon, a particle of light can just travel through space, empty space very easily. To a neutrino, normal matter is like empty space. It can just fly right through us. You don't even notice it. There are billions of them passing through you right now, most of them generated in the core of the sun through nuclear fusion. Um, but that's that's sort of what they are. And they, they play their roles when stars explode, neutrinos are generated. Just in the cores of stars, normally they're generated. Uh, a lot of nuclear reactors generate neutrinos. And so there's a bunch of them flying around all the time. 
Real quick, explain how it can pass right through matter and not interact with matter, if that's possible to explain quickly. Well, that's complicated. But, <laughs> but honestly, there are just some subatomic particles that are not interested in interacting with other particles. It's just the way they're, uh, they're assembled, the way they're put together. It's part of the equations that govern the universe. Um, and in this case, it's kind of like, oh, you know, you put an electron and a proton together and they love each other. One has a negative charge and one has a positive charge. Whereas two neutrons are just kind of sitting there. They they don't have any charge whatsoever. They don't they don't really want to interact unless you force them to. I know some people like that. Uh, neutrinos are kind of the same way. Once they're generated, they don't care about normal matter and they travel at almost the speed of light. So phew, they just move on to do what they do. Okay. Okay. Um I think that answers my question well enough for now. A, I have a related have? question. Okay. Sorry, Phil. Can neutrinos mutate somehow and become a, quote, super neutrino, end quote? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first of all. Is that your full scientific and complex answer is no? How much time we got? Okay, now picture, <laughs> picture me ticking these off on my fingers, right? First of all, particles don't mutate, okay? Living things mutate. Uh, and so that's the wrong word. What you would say is um, you can convert subatomic particles one into another. Um, you can take three quarks and squish them together and they become a proton or a neutron. So, so you can convert things one to another. They don't mutate. It's the wrong word to use. Particles can be converted into other particles. Uh, so if you, you know, if you, if you could break apart, I don't know, like a, a proton, say you get three quarks, but they have to have something to change into. There's no such thing as a super neutrino. It doesn't even make sense. <laughs> they can't go into a little neutrino phone booth and change into a super neutrino is what you're saying. That is correct. Uh, you know, a super okay. neutrino is a neutrino with a cape. Um, it, it, it just, <laughs> it, it doesn't work that way. That That's just not a thing. It's something they made up for the movie. I gotcha. If they had consulted... A scientist, I mean, they may have, I don't know. A lot of movie producers and writers and stuff consult scientists and, you know, whether they take the advice of the scientist or not is up to them. Mm -hmm. it, it may not matter or it may not help the story at all. Um, in this case, you know, I'm sure given 18 seconds of thought, I could have come up with something better than what they did. However, I think the way this movie came out is that they already had a lot of it put together and then they decided uh -huh. to make it sort of fit the 2012 theme. So that's kind of yeah. why this movie fails spectacularly. I have a very serious scientific question for you now. Um, the neutrinos apparently get super pissed at the earth and come in and muck about the place. In this movie, Phil, why do you think neutrinos are so angry with our planet? Wouldn't you be? <laughs> I mean, I, picture me now just vaguely waving in all directions. In the movie, there's like a solar flare and it generates neutrinos. And I, I can't remember if they mutate when they interact with the Earth's core or they, they somehow they turn into super neutrinos on their way here. None of this makes any sense. It's just word salad. But yeah, none of the, it, it doesn't work this way anyway. Neutrinos from the sun and the sun makes a lot of them. There are zillions of them passing through the Earth. Very few interact even with the densest part of the earth in our core. So, you know, none of that makes any sense. The amount of neutrinos, eh, let me back up and say that even in a solar flare, I don't think you would, you would make neutrinos. It's possible, maybe the temperatures get high enough that you could get hydrogen fusion. And so you'd get a handful of neutrinos out of this, but not enough. And, and flares only last for a few minutes. This is supposed to take years. To, the, to heat the earth's core up and cause all these disasters. So, you yes. know, at every, it's just every step of the way, I shouldn't be touching my face. <laughs> I was putting my head in my hands and I shouldn't be touching my face. It's true. We shouldn't be touching our face right now. The way uh, I processed the plot for 2012, it looked like this to me. It looked like there was a solar flare that apparently didn't last a few seconds and, w and the sun got angry and kicked out super neutrinos they heated up the Earth's core, which somehow equaled then rearrangement of the Earth's tectonic plates. Is there any of that that passes any kind of scientific muster? Not a single phrase of what you just said. <laughs> Not a single comma-separated series of clauses makes any sense to me. Like I said, flares don't last long. They don't make neutrinos in any significant amount. They don't make super neutrinos because they don't exist. 
uh, they would mostly pass right through the Earth without interacting with it. Now, having said that, if you could somehow screw with the Earth's core and make it hotter, yeah, that wouldn't be great. Um, the, the heat from the core passes through the Earth's mantle, and uh, you know the, the mantle's not really a liquid. It's actually considered to be a solid, but it can move. It can flow. Um, and the way that works is complicated. And every time I try to think about it, it makes my head hurt. Geologists have explained this to me many times. Um, mm -hmm. But the, it can flow like a fluid, but it's not a liquid. Those are two different things. It's solid. But if you were to dump a lot of extra energy into the mantle, you know, maybe it would expand a little bit. And the crust is the you know 5 to 20 or whatever kilometer thick rocky surface of the earth that floats on the mantle itself so if the mantle expanded yeah the crust would start to split because you know you, something inside is getting bigger and the outside isn't the outside's gonna gonna start splitting and cracking so you know mm -hmm. kinda mm. <laughs> okay a had a, a a very good scientific question i also have a very very good scientific question i bet um <laughs> I know you are not a geologist, but you are a scientist. So therefore, I think you can address this question. I noticed the first few earthquakes in the cinematic masterpiece that is 2012, they were very polite and followed paved streets, even when those streets made 90 degree turns. As a scientist, how do you explain fault lines that follow the rules of the road? Well, <laughs> um, earthquakes are, are well known to uh, be civilly obedient. Um, oh yeah, you know they, they yes. move the speed limit. Uh, they you know they they stay to the right in America. I guess they stay to the left in England. I don't know. Yeah, that was that was. They're like... very good for rush hour. <laughs> yeah, Earthquake. they just very yeah. good they just hour. wait. It, that was something in the movie that it, it it just of the many cinematic failings of this just execrable movie. Um, it's just the fact that every scene ends with John Cusack using some sort of different mode of transportation to barely escape the earth <laughs> splitting underneath him, whether it's his limo or I don't even remember a car, or an airplane. And it just, it's, then there's know, an like, arc at the end. You can there's do this arc. once, twice, maybe if you yeah. change things up, but it was just over and over again. So yeah, no, it was just, and it was just ridiculous. There were many chase scenes. Look, Roland Emmerich, who made this movie, also did Independence Day. And Independence Day is ridiculous, but it's really mm -hmm. entertaining. Um, I, it, with all the scientific and, and oh, just all the faults of that movie, it's fun to watch. This one was tedious. Yeah, that's a really good way to say that, Phil. That's exactly, that was, uh, one, we, we kind of started it a little bit late uh, because of the workday or whatever, and we had to actually finish watching it today. And I thought, okay, so I got some sleep and I'm now a little bit <laughs> sharper in my head. Maybe this will, I won't be so frustrated by it. And it just got worse. Yeah. Once I was no longer tired, I was like, oh, this is so ridiculous. Yeah. You, they could have just like yanked whole segments out of the movie and it wouldn't have made any difference. It, the running time is two and a half hours plus. So it's not your imagination. That movie just never ends. Phil, is it, is it? As bad, worse than, or equally bad to Armageddon? Wow. Um, I would say this is the Armageddon of, of geology movies. Um, <laughs> although most people say the core is the Armageddon of... of, of Ooh. And yeah, I, uh, I asked A if we could watch the core for Story Smack, and she said, sure, if you want to dissolve the partnership and <laughs> never see each other again, by all means. So the, we will the, not be doing the core, which is pretty spectacular. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. It's it's got its moments, and I met the guy who wrote that movie. We were introduced by uh, Amy Berg, who is a writer, and thought that we were going to start like attacking each other. But in fact, it wasn't like that at all. And he, you know, it, it's funny when you talk to geologists, they th they say, you know, Armageddon was okay. I mean, the core was a piece of crap and clearly scientifically terrible, but <laughs> Armageddon was okay. And you talk to astronomers and they're like, oh, the core was okay, but oh my God, Armageddon, what a piece of crap. Um, oh, how fun. <laughs> um, it turns totally out they're both true. terrible. Honestly, you know, when, when it, if you're trying to compare them scientifically, I, it's probably a dead heat. But Armageddon wow. was many things, but it wasn't really tedious. Um, it, it never really stops to give you a, a moment to think about it going on too long. This movie That's has the just weird thing all about movies like this is like um, they could have done a plot with 
actual science and the plot would basically function exactly the same. These really aren't meant to be any kind of, they're just adventure movies. And then they substitute, quote unquote, new, super neutrino angry at the planet science for any real, for supernatural shit, so... Well, and I also think Phil makes a really good point about if you are so, if you are entertained enough, even if you're entertained by the spectacular of it, like a Michael Bay movie or a Roland Emmerich movie like this one is, if that's enough, then that's more entertaining. But he's right. This is a terrible movie that isn't all that, it, it doesn't, it kind of plods along plot wise and it's, it doesn't have any, you know, there's no kaiju, there's no anything big and fun. So it's you notice the fact that it's so terrible even more. Mm. And I think that's true. Cause I, I understand that, <laughs> that like Armageddon was a terrible scientific movie, but you know, it's pretty sometimes to look at. Thank you for helping us talk through the quote unquote science in 2012. Uh, yeah. Where can the people listening find out more about you? Um, I'm everywhere. Um, well, that's not true. Cause I'm not on Facebook. I'm on Twitter as bad astronomer and Instagram as the bad astronomer. The best place to find me is on my about.me. It's about.me slash philplate. And I write the Bad Astronomy blog on sci-fi, S-Y-F-Y dot com. And if anybody out there is looking up about me, it's P-H-I-L-P-L-A-I-T. Thank you for being on the show and, and sciencing just the crap out of 2012 for us, Phil. We appreciate it. Thank you. And next time, call me before you watch the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. All right. Love you guys too. That was Dr. Phil Plate gracing us with his sciencey presence on the show. Now, as I mentioned in the open, the sound quality may not be great right now because we are in our underground bunker that sadly is not shaped like my head. But next time. Next, next time. time. We next just time. didn't have the time. We, it, was, it came on us too quick. We, if we only had some warning about I know. COVID. I know. Some kind of warning anywhere. I know. Been great. Um, so we are not going to edit any of this. We're going to just plow through this. So if you guys hear us screw up and things aren't quite as smooth as they usually are, it's because we're trying to bring that sunshine to your little heart. Yeah, we have had a handful of emails and a handful of posts on Facebook um, asking for just more content because now everybody's home. And uh, several of the questions have been, can can you make sure that, or is Sigler in place, the live Facebook thing, is that PG or PG-13 or R? And that's a little too hard to say. Yeah. But we're going to do our best to keep these, as always, kind of PG, PG-13. Because I know now you've got little ears. If you are a parent, you have little ears right around the house every single minute of every single that day. That was excellent that you just informed me of that. because <laughs> That's why I jumped I'm in a, right here. When it comes to the, the curse words, I'm an artist. I'm not going to Well, lie. and this movie has a lot we did swear. To curse about. We, little, we swore a little bit watching this movie. Yes. Oh my goodness, this movie. Okay, so uh, all we can do now is go through the movie, talk about the movie's interesting and not so interesting parts because we had. I mean, we we kind of came out of the gate strong with Phil, and now it's yeah. you know, now it's just you and me. So. Well, and of course we are we are fans of science, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he is a scientist, so he yes. got to say intelligent, lovely, graceful things that we could understand. And I'm going to start by saying, right out of the gate, this movie sucks so hard, <laughs> because at four minutes and ten seconds in, yeah. our lead scientist, and in fact, I'm not sure, I think it might be the Eastern Indian scientist, mm -hmm. um, says, uh, neutrinos haven't acted like this before. Yes, that's true. That's what he said. Which in si in a scientific approach to that, they would not be neutrinos anymore. They would be something else at that point. Yes. You know, I don't act like well, a neutrino either, but you can't just look at me and go, neutrinos haven't acted like A before. That's not how that works. It's a super neutrino, though. No, it, not it then. It's it when they get to be that they're uh, coming into super neutrino, which again, doesn't exist. Well, let's start with something near and dear to my heart. The movie opens up in a 11,000 feet deep in a copper mine. Um, they say it used to be the deepest copper mine in the world, at which point I still feel smug because I have a book called Earth Core. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and my Earth Core takes place at 16,000 feet down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So initially I was like very worried, like they're not going to have any geothermal heat. They had geothermal heat. They didn't explain why it was hot. They just said it was super hot down there. Um, I said some days it can hit 120 degrees. So I'm like, I'm still feeling very smug at this point. Because uh, Earth Core went deeper. I know it's a PG-13 show, but Earth Core did, <laughs> did go deeper. And it would stay PG-13 if you don't make those connections. <laughs> uh, it's like a Shrek. It's a Shrek comment. It it's is, something yeah. only the adults will hear. And then we, we cover the neutrinos uh, from a solar flare causing a physical reaction. 
and we stopped the movie and had a conversation. <laughs> and our conversation was, okay, is this the one gimme? Because in any... We did indeed, yeah. Any science fiction movie, you have to have one... The audience has to accept at least one significant gimme. For example, Star Wars, faster than the speed of light. Okay, mm-hmm. you, you got to... Like, any, any uh, Star Trek, any movie like that, you have to not get pedantic about, well, we can't really go with speed of light, so that's kind of impossible. You got to roll with that. Yeah. And then the Force in Star Wars, for example. So there's a few things instead of like, if you can accept these, we'll tell you a great story. And I'll even say, for me... I'm happy with one big gimme and mm-hmm. one smaller gimme. Okay. Like faster than light travel is would be a big gimme maybe. Mm-hmm. But the fact that everybody speaks English in their own country of origin accents is also a gimme because that's not how that would be, you know, necessarily, especially yeah. in these disaster emergency where people are sort of thrown together. Mm-hmm. Legitimately, everybody but the Chinese people in 2012 spoke English with an accent. So that was another, another gimme for you. Yeah. But we, so we talked about, okay, are these crazy made-up neutrinos? Is this the gimme? Because if this is the gimme, we can roll with it. Little did we know there was going to be an endless Macy's Day parade of gimmies strolling so. down the street that is cracked by tectonic plates. I, yeah, uh, I think what happened really is the Roland Ember got it a little mixed up, and he gave us one true thing, which, which is Amanda Pete and John Cusack lo- characters love their children. Yeah. Okay. So the rest had to be. So instead of <laughs> instead of one gimme, he's like, here's one thing that's true. Yeah, your gimme is the one thing that's true. Great. All the rest of this is bat shit. Oops. So bat crap. Ha <laughs> ha, <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh, wasn't me. Ha <laughs> ha. So then things started to go downhill for me. Again, this is very personal for me. I got a sixteen thousand foot mine, meticulously researched in my books. Four minutes and twenty one seconds. They rain on my parade. They say, this water tank at the bottom of the 11,000-foot copper mine goes down another 6,000 feet. That would be 17,000 feet, and that's deeper than I had in Earth Core, and I was super pissed, a.k.a. 3.21 miles, because uh, Earth Core is set with a mine three miles deep, and that's a goddamn world record. That's and what's, a record. what's interesting about it. that is anybody who's listening to this who's read Earth Core, like me, I haven't heard or read Earth Core in a while, mm-hmm. but I absolutely remember the, and, and it's such a pivotal moment, the cool suit and the technology that makes it okay and how much your characters suffer just by being outside of the technology. Like mm-hmm. they can't breathe down there. They can't touch anything without getting burned. There's all these things, none of which we ever touch on one little bit in 2012. No. Uh, my other favorite part of that scene is they have a giant 6,000 foot deep iron tank to hold water that's got a pressure spin wheel on top and the water's boiling. So that's not going to end well all, for also anybody. Also an iron tank, which is a bad choice. Yeah, it's, a bad, it's all a bad choice. Yeah. All of a sudden, we are our main character, it took me a while to understand, his name was Adrian Helmsley, mm-hmm. uh, played by... Chitawar Ejiofor. Chitawar Ejiofor, who was... Uh, Pretty good in this. He he's did, yeah. He's he he did admirably with this. He made he lemonade given. out of these lemons, and you, I like it. What I do like when I see a really bad movie is watching the actors work real hard. Yeah, there's a movie uh, takes place at the Hoover Dam. Paul Giamatti is a scientist. Is the scientist that people ignore, and he's at. I can't. It might be Pacific Rim. Uh, I can't remember the movie, but it's one of those things where you're like, okay. He is a world-class actor, and I am here for this. Mm -hmm. All of this stupidity, all of this crazy pants talk, I am here for it because he's selling it with everything he has. And Mm -hmm. I think that that Adrian Helmsley in this has that same approach. I will say, you're going to be surprised. There were parts of this movie that I liked. (laughs) And I kept them to myself because I, I didn't want to embarrass myself in front of you. Fair. One of the things I like is... They completely skip the mandatory, hi, I'm a scientist, this bad thing is going to happen, and everybody ignores him or her and decides they want to keep the beaches open for tourist tourist season. From square one, before we even get to the opening credits, they believe him. He walks, he barges his way into a White House black tie affair, uh, Helmsley does, Uh and says, you got to read this report. And the guy, and what's that? His name is Oliver Platt. Oliver Platt. And he is the White House chief of staff. Mr. Anheuser. Mr. Anheuser. Carl Anheuser. Carl Anheuser reads the report and boom, like the whole scene from the time he picks up the report to the time he says, okay, now you report to me, to Helmsley. That's like 30 seconds. So they skip all of the doubt and go right into full belief in what's coming, which was unique and I guess refreshing for a movie like this. Yeah, and I'll also say 
it's that's kind of a little bit of a MacGuffin or a red herring mm -hmm. because Oliver Platt's character turns out to be the biggest antagonist and the villain of the movie. Um, such as that is, that's yeah. not the earth itself, you know? Okay. Okay. But you're right. The very first thing he does is like my good man, let's handle this. And literally at every turn he's looking out for his, he's looking out for his, um, constituency, I guess, or the, the, people he wants to save or whatever but you're right he totally does we'll, just walk right in we'll get to him more soon so this but is i will a, say i said this when we were watching the movie i love oliver platt yeah. i think oliver platt can and should if he wants to sort of grow into all that like broad-shouldered chaz palmentieri-esque swagger that he can totally do if he wants to i would yeah. like to see more of him in movies uh, let's see, then we were moving along, and that movie starts out in 2010. Within the, 2012 starts in 2010. 2011, they're starting to hide the world's artifacts and, and get those put away. And uh, then we get to, it's 11 minutes and 51 seconds in before we see John Cusack. Ugh. And uh, I, for, I forgot the world was supposed to end in 2012. It wasn't until I saw John Cusack, for some reason, I forgot completely about the Mayan calendar prediction, yeah. which is why they made the effing movie in the first place. It is, yes. And I'm 12 minutes into the movie before I remember, oh, that's right, the world was supposed to end in 2012. Mm -hmm. Dang nabbit. So we see John, and uh, he's a man living by himself. So, of course, he's a slob in an unkept apartment. Of that's course. just mandatory for Hollywood, because men cannot take care of themselves in Hollywood. Unless they're gay in Hollywood. Then they have meticulous apartments. They're always perfect. True, yeah. true. So, uh, and that was interesting. And when did the... But credits he, roll. No. Okay, continue. He um, also, right around that same time frame, he's starting to learn the, the neutrino story and everything. And I just, uh, we didn't talk about it with Phil, and I wish we could have. We I, I had remembered it because he's actual scientist. But there is something called the AMANDA array in Antarctica. Okay. It is... The AMANDA is an acronym. It stands for Antarctic Muon and Neutrino Detection Array. And it is a neutrino telescope mm. located beneath... The Admonson Scott Station on Antarctica, okay. which is very close to the, it is the, the, very close to the, where the South Pole was when they built the station. All right. Um, and it's been there looking for neutrino. It catches like, it, it wants to catch a record of a neutrino passing through the earth. And they are so non-reactive that it's just sitting out there and it, it catches some sometimes, but we do this every single day, every moment of every so you're day. So you it should have been in the movie? It should have been in the movie because we're already looking for neutrinos. But it kind of goes back to your thing where they sort of, they take him at his word. He would not have to explain like, okay, dudes, we've been looking for a, a record of a neutrino for ages now. Yeah. So that all of a sudden now we see them and they're super, maybe yeah. like Phil says, because they're wearing capes, they're easier to see. Yes. Um, but I feel like that's a, like, it, we talked a little bit, of, uh, well, actually, we talk a lot about this when we watch things. The easy way for you to fix this for a person like me, I will ride with you if you say, like, gosh, we've never even seen any of this. In the last decade, the Amanda Array, you know, recorded four neutrinos, and now we see 17. I don't know why. Like, mm -hmm. I'd be down for that. Just but, a quick a quick couple of lines. Yes. Anything relevant and true about <laughs> neutrinos would be nice. To be fair, this movie is two hours and 30 minutes long. So I'm sure they trimmed some. So they probably had the Amanda Ray in there and had to cut it out because we want to see a building fall into a plane. I mean, that's what I paid yeah, my money well, for. Yeah. So 16 minutes, 30 seconds of the movie. Here come the FX. Things are starting to break down. And cause this is what we paid for. The sure as F wasn't character development. We yeah. paid to see crazy special effects. We, uh, let's see here. Uh, let the love interest begin. The love interest begins at 20 minutes. This Helmsley is, uh, making goo goo eyes at the president's daughter. Mm -hmm. And my favorite, of course, is Danny, Danny Glover. I'm like, yay, Danny Glover's in this. I was like, sweet, he's the president. He found a job he's not too old for. All right, <laughs> this works out pretty well. And there's a scene with his daughter where he says, only a dozen people in this administration know what I'm about to tell you. And she says, dad, what's going on? And I'm like, he, he should have responded, didn't I just say I was about to tell you? Why do you got to interrupt me all the time? <laughs> so some of the dialogue in this is, is not so good. We're 21 minutes in before I realize I have no credibility for Adrian Helmsley. What is this guy's, did I miss it? Did they establish his background or is he just, I go look at stuff and then I go crash a black tie affair and the president makes me the science director. Is that pretty much it or did I miss something? I think that's pretty much it. Um, there is a moment where he, <coughs> several times in the movie, 
uh, he references his Eastern Indian counterpart. And we see the Eastern Indian counterpart on screen. And at some point they talk to each other and then they end up getting separated to go to their families or whatever. But what I understand, the closest I can get is they work together. He is more senior. Our, our um, protagonist is more senior than the Eastern Indian scientist. And the Eastern Indian scientist is actually the one who has the provable data. Mm. And he passes it off, but they work together. So they totally love, you know, they, they trust each other and that's good. So he's the Eastern Indian's boss. I just put in a cough drop, you guys. So I might have the COVID. Who can say? Uh, <laughs> we're watching this movie and I'm trying to give this movie the benefit of the doubt. I don't like John Cusack. I like this movie. I don't like this movie. I'm trying to benefit the doubt. And at that point, 22 minutes, 30 seconds in, I'm watching and he's camping with his kids at Yellowstone. And he hops the fence with his kids, a new fence that wasn't there before. He wants to take them to see this lake. And I said, you know what? From a storytelling perspective, him hopping the fence and checking out the and checking out the do not pass lake is interesting. I'm like, okay, cool. He's a little bit of a, re- a little bit of a rebel. Wants his children to see this cool thing. Doesn't pay attention to the law. I'm like, okay, this is good. Now we're getting a little character, a deep character who loves his kids. And then he takes his kids to a bubbling lake of death with smoking, <laughs> rotting caribou corpses. Apparently there's caribou in, in Yellowstone. Who knew? <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck? Ooh, sorry. That was me. <laughs> I, mean, I got to put a dollar in a swear jar. I'm like, bro, don't take your grade school children to the bubbling lake of death with the big yellow lines that say, do not come here if you want your children to have non-mutated genitalia. It said it right on the fence. <laughs> right on the fence. And he ta- I'm, and now, like, how are we supposed to have any sympathy for this guy? Him and his two innocent kids should die. Because, frankly, it's better for the gene pool of the world. Oh, well, I mean, should die. That's a whole nother thing with this movie. John Cusack not helping humanity survive. No, we're going to get to how bad he mucks up the works. Yeah. And then, of course, oh, snap, didn't know Woody Harrelson was in this. So oh, my was... God. Does Woody Harrelson remember being in this? I don't think oh so. Oh, my God. What crazy character was that? And how high was he? I, I hope he was real, real high. He was obviously real, real he high. A real, real big check for it. That would be all you these would, things would be great. Yes. Oh, okay. my goodness. So high. And you <clears> see <throat> his butt. As a plumber's crack, when yep. you first meet him, I don't want that business. No. I'm fine seeing Woody Harrelson's butt, but I don't want crazy mountain man, grizzly man butt. So no. We're, so we're anti-grizzly man, plumber's butt. Plumber's butt. Because you know what he's not? If he's up there in the woods, what? he's not a plumber. Good point. Good point. There are rules in unions, sir. <clears throat> okay. You can't just flash a, a, a plumber's crack. So we're 25 minutes in, and I will admit now I'm, I'm shallow. I've, I've always said I'm shallow, petty, and bitter. I've never been shy about this with the, with the junkies with anybody. Now that uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor has read author John Cusack's book and is a fan of the book, I at that point I forgave the entire plot. Oh my gosh! And uh, it's a terrible thing that you did because the plot line there is that these two were destined to meet out of all the people on Earth yep. because only four hundred and twenty six copies of his book were sold. Which isn't a thing. Cause we it know. isn't a thing. You can't, they don't measure that small of a number. No, it is not a thing. And they say it several times. But I am, I'm in because, you know, give props to novel writers. Um, <laughs> okay, so fair. Point, Everybody's got to like, eat. All right, I can get behind. Now, I, I was up and down in this movie several times. So at this point, I'm up in this movie. Then I'm down in this movie. 26 minutes in, we get the phrase, the Earth's crust is destabilizing. And I'm like, this sounds very serious. <laughs> well, and you can tell because it was uh, it was delivered in quake and with a lot of gravitas. <laughs> and then my favorite line of the movie, uh, and this was another scientist character whom I don't remember, but he was on Star Trek, if that helps. <laughs> okay. Um, turns out the Earth's core, not Earth core, the core of the Earth mm-hmm. is heating up. And then this man drops this wonderful piece that I'd rewind and make sure I had it all written down correctly. Well, you did. All our scientific all our scientific advancements, our fancy machines, the Mayans saw this coming thousands of years ago. I'm like, what? <laughs> what did the the Mayans saw neutrinos coming? No, what? No. Yes. No, they did not. They also, just knew that the world was ending. Also, they say this is never, they clearly specify these solar flares this large and neutrinos have never happened in the world before. So how did the Mayans know about it? They've never seen it before. And did the Mayans say anything about March 2020? Because I would like to know that too. I believe so. I do. The conspiracy theorists who 
we're very worried about 2012. We're very meticulous. Very meticulous in your math. Yes, right, yes. right, right. I think they're down like the day and time and stuff like that. But no mention of what we're, as a global community, going through right now. So 2012 is also a family drama. <laughs> okay. John Cusack, divorced from Amanda Peet. Mm -hmm. Amanda Peet's shacked up with a new guy, a plastic surgeon. He has a Porsche. He's doing very well for himself. Mm -hmm. And another sort of break from Hollywood norms, the stepdad slash new husband is not a jerk. He's not a total jerk. He's a little bit bristly, but he's not a jerk. He takes care of the kids. He's nice to Amanda Peet. There's no problem with this guy whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But he gives the boy, a boy and a girl, he gives the boy a cell phone. And while they are camping by the bubbling nuclear lake of death... Uh, John Cusack sees the phone and takes the phone away from the kid and says, hey, a cell phone is a family decision. And the kid says, what family zips up the tent in John Cusack's face? And I'm like, all right, I don't have children, but if I did and that happened, I wouldn't have any children after that because but you also, somebody would have got murdered. You also would not, two things about that scene. You would not be there because you would also not have been at the bubbling lake of death. True, true. And, uh, and the kid should take back his cell phone so he has something to play with once he zips up the tent. I'll tell you this. <clears throat> a little insight to me as a person. Uh, I did get to meet my great-grandpa very briefly as a small child. Mm -hmm. And before he died, he gave me one piece of advice. Oh, Lord. And he said, when you see a decomposing, mutated caribou walk in the other direction very, very fast. So I would have taken my kids and I would have gotten out of there. You're definitely a fiction writer. I'm telling you, he was, a, he was, what I, little I knew him, he was a great guy. So we're 30 minutes into the movie. Just strap on your seatbelts, people. We're 30 minutes into a two hour and 30 minute movie. Oh Lord. There's more Mayans. And now I think this is Woody Harrelson talking about. Now this spooked me up because, hey, welcome to end times that we're in right now. First, the stock market would go. Then the economy, boom. Then the dollar, boom. Then pandemonium in the streets. And I'm like, that's what we're going through right now. My fellow COVIDians, we're yes. getting there. And you guys who, who helped, who quote unquote, helped us pick 2012, we have a lot of special smoochies for you. Yeah. Special smoochies. 35 minutes in, uh, we see more of those polite geological fault lines that follow pavement. And then the, actually then the new husband, Gordon, turns out to be a little bit jerk because he's making fun of the author only selling 422 copies. We established this isn't a thing, but you do not make fun of an author when their books don't sell well. It's mean. It's mean. Yes. Even though it's 426 copies. Not 426. 22. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's a percentage improvement. At 40 minutes in, we get a Michael Buffer cameo. Let's get ready to rumble, <laughs> which is great because I didn't know he was in it. And I said, let's get ready to rumble when we were down to our final two movies in the Sigler in place on the Facebook Live, so I feel like I'm psychic. It's I thought I mean that works. We're 40 minutes in the movie, and I'm like, this is starting to feel like the Tom Cruise version of War of the Worlds, which yeah. is doesn't really matter how many millions or billions of people die as long as this family unit stays together. Yes, that's yes. the happy. Everything's going to be okay if well, the nuclear family stays together. And remember, this we. Uh, I completely bottomed out in, I'd say, the last 20 minutes of this movie. Um, <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, we watched half of it yesterday. We watched the other half this morning. And I really thought, well, I'm, I, I'm tired. You know, it's, we're probably all having this difficulty adjusting to working in different confines, working from home, all mm -hmm. that stuff. Mm -hmm. So even though we have a live, uh, you have a live workspace in the office and it is kind of like that, I was thinking, okay, maybe I'm just, I'm stressed out. I'm worried about my folks, blah, blah, blah. Nope. Even well rested this this morning, it was mm -hmm. absolutely un. I, I'm going to say unrealistic, but it was terrible. Like it was terrible and unrealistic. Uh -huh. It was poorly. It is a poor re facsimile of the world because you're right. The only thing that matters, which they actually end up getting, is the family unit stays together. Yeah. In the face of the total destruction of habitable Earth. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Who the flip cares? Uh, it's, a, it's a strange, strange structure. So 46 minutes in, the Earth starts to chase John Cusack. Well, these things happen. It is the most ludicrous chase scene since 1988's Deadpool, a Dirty Harry movie starring Clint Eastwood, in which he was chased by a little tiny remote car through the streets of San Francisco. Great movie. Like, not great. It's a good movie. It's a fun. It's a movie. It's a mo definitely a movie. It's a movie with Clint Eastwood. So you've got that going for you. Which is nice. 
Okay. So now I'm the, the, the up and down stock market ticker of Scott's appreciation for this film. I mean, let's not say stock market ticker. Let's say the up and down of the very polite highway the very uh, polite, yeah. The cracks in the highway. Like now, I'm I'm up. I'm on the ascent again because I know I'm making fun of this movie, mm-hmm. but I'm also a product of my upbringing and my culture, and uh, cars falling out of parking structures and smashing into other cars and buildings toppling and innocent little old ladies who did nothing wrong smashing into rising land masses is tight. I was just, <laughs> <laughs> like, like this is great. Go John, go! And there's people just dying all over the giant buildings, and so now we're starting to get into the Roland Emmerich. You, all you did was rent a seat to watch crazy cataclysmic shit happen, and he starts to deliver. Yes, he definitely does. And the thing is, I think if you have just fallen off a cabbage truck, fully formed mm-hmm. in your adulthood, and you've never ever experienced a Hollywood movie like this. I'll be honest, I'm not sure you could get inside it and enjoy it. I I think it would be too confusing. But we have seen other Roland Emmerich movies. Mm -hmm. We've seen Michael Bay movies. Mm -hmm. We've seen big movies like this. We've seen Independence Day. So we can like, cool, this is going to be that kind of a movie. Let me put on this hat, which is how I can enjoy it. I put on that hat, the protective gloves, the full (laughs) face mask. I put on the shoes. I put on everything. And you know what it didn't do? Didn't make it an enjoyable movie. You tie backed up. And I definitely not... Tyvek suited up and I was all outbreak on it and it did no good. So we're uh, 50 minutes into the movie and I'm digging the earthquake chasing John Cusack because I've, I've thrown in the towel. I'm like, all right, this is ludicrous. Let's enjoy it. Let's have fun. And then it starts to remind me of the uh, Matthew Broderick Godzilla movie. Mm-hmm. And like, you're in a plane, pull back on the yoke and fly up. <laughs> over the falling buildings, not under them, not sort of by them or through, not them. through them. And you know what? Don't when a, a giant crevasse opens up in the earth and is swallowing people left and right, don't dive. You're into not a red it. team leader. Don't go anywhere yeah. in there. Don't go in there. <laughs> you are not. Not that person. Uh, I was I was impressed with myself for the Godzilla reference. I, the red team leader. You get points. <laughs> you get point fist, fist bump. Bumps. You get points for that. <laughs> And then 58 minutes in, here comes the super mega volcano. This which is, yes. I love the super mega volcano. So now I'm back up again. I'm back up again. Um, you don't get to see super mega volcanoes all that often with a big budget like that. It was pretty great. Um, now, this will sound shocking that... Hold on. Got to take off the dog. No, no, no. Got to take off the dog collar. There we go. Take off the I told you there's no editing in this damn thing. So I'm not going to shock you. 56 minutes in, this is where I start to see the bad writing. Oh, no, yeah. sir. No, that is no. a bald-faced lie. <laughs> but this is where the bad writing finally takes over for you. It ascends. It, it climbs like a phoenix on fire, glowing, making the glow around it. Gordon, who we mentioned, Wait, he's the new husband. Before you tell me about Gordon, I will yeah. say, gl- like a glowing phoenix springing from the fire or whatever you just said, yeah, yeah. better stage direction than this whole movie. <laughs> but tell us about Gordon. So Gordon, who's only alive because John Cusack came and got his kids and yelled at everybody like, get in the gosh darn car when there's an earthquake. Because Gordon's like, there's no problem. There's no problem here. He's kept everybody alive. He's found a plane and the pilot's dead. So Gordon's flying the plane. We've already seen Gordon fly the plane. And then as John Cusack is being chased by the earthquake, Gordon says, you're going to listen to this guy? He's a nut job. (laughs) Like, Gordon with his own human eyes can already see at least 10,000 people are dead all around him. The city is crushed. Buildings have fallen. There's giant crevasses all over the place. Uh, Is that crevasses? Multiple, Mm -hmm. a multiple crevasse. And now he's like... He's saying, this guy's a nut job. I don't want to follow him anymore. It's like, oh, co- oh come on. This is, <laughs> even in this context, that's pretty bad. Yes. There's a lot of pretty mm-hmm. bad. And it's, it's all, it's, I think it's sort of a death by a thousand cuts, right? It's, I could deal with one terribly poorly developed character. Mm-hmm. I could deal with one conversation that had really flat dialogue. I could deal with, let's go with no explanation at all. But this is literally a, a movie made of, of every single beat, every single scene, every single moment is terrible in its own right and then strung together. We haven't even met the, uh, at this point, we haven't even met the the Chinese family that really saves the world. Yes. None of that stuff. 
And I can't believe just I can't believe it that I fell for it when that happens, which is a little later than this. Um, and they get it's like I a whole forget, it's a whole know. other movie later. It is. This is a, this was a rough movie, y'all. So we're one hour into the movie, and now John Cusack is being chased by the super mega volcano, and I'm like, Mother Nature hates this sucker. I mean, just they want they, Mother Nature wants John Cusack dead, but you know what? He's plucky, he's resilient. And he's crafty. And he mm. finds a way to stay ahead of Mother Nature. One hour and six minutes in, they say, to, to provide the, the pr- true gravitas of what's come, the Olympic Games have been suspended. And I'm like, what a bunch of BS. <laughs> the Olympic Games would never be suspended. That'll never so, happen in the real world. Sorry, excuse me, Mr. Sigler? Yes. Mr. Sigler. Yes. Um, this year's Olympic Games got postponed to next year. Today. That could never happen in the real world. I just said just just ha- is, just happened. Are, are the Olympic Games chasing John Cusack? That's what I want to well, know. I mean, we should check in on John Cusack because apparently, yes. One hour and ten minutes in, we get the um, moment for Danny Glover to show up his acting chops, and uh, apparently, the president we've already seen twice had a wife recently who knew the end of the world was coming, and she wanted a lottery so everybody could have a chance to go. We didn't meet the wife. We didn't know about the wife. It seems she might have been vaguely penciled in just for the scene. So, <laughs> well, you know he has a kid. Yeah, he does have a kid. So he he could have adopted a baby girl and didn't need. But if he made that child, he would have needed a a, a person who could grow a child. So yes. So now, I've got a bone to pick with you. All righty. You and the internet call Oliver Platt the bad guy or the villain of this movie. He is the only practical MF talking straight sense all the time. He's like, you can't take 8 billion people in Air Force One. And he's right. Hi, he's the only one like, we have to think about the species, not about your little bleeding heart. But he's not heart. thinking about the species. Yes, he's, he is. No, he's not. He's thinking about himself because he bald-faced lies to... Adrian, Mm -hmm. when he's like, wait a minute, how were these people chosen? And he instantly says the marketing line. All the countries of the world, they picked their best in the world. There's a lottery. And he's like, and then you watch this stream of wealthy adults, Mm -hmm. clearly wealthy adults, one of whom's carrying a flippin' tiny dog. Yeah. Parade by. And you, the message you get is, of course, and then he turns around and he's like, they bought tickets? Really? What about all the workers who have been building this? So he didn't care about saving humanity well, as much as he cared about saving his own body. That's in there, too. He also says, who do you, how do you think we paid to build all these giant arcs? You had to get some cash. You know, I mean, instead of like knowing the world's going to end in two years, so nationalize I, that stuff and I build st- a bunch of them. Yeah. I still say that. He is he is the human villain of this story. He's okay. not pure evil, you know, and he's not necessarily wrong in those things, but he is in it for himself and in an, in a position of power in the government, and that makes him the bad guy. I agree to disagree. Uh, this is fun. The random guy that John Cusack drove in his limo happens to be at the Las Vegas airport when John Cusack's trying to get his family out. And John Cusack's plane doesn't work anymore. Uh, the guy also happens to have a golden ticket to the space arc. And John and Gordon happen to come across him when it turns out that random guy needs a second pilot for his giant Russian plane. Gordon will be the co-pilot. No coincidence at all. That's totally believable. Yes. Totally believable. I agree. Totally believable in this particular environs of this movie. We'll say it that way. One hour and 18 minutes in. I'm now down again in the movie and I have my arms crossed. A frown on my face. Fussy. I'm leaning back on the couch, fussy. Like, this is ridiculous. I'm not buying any of this at all. And my Apple Watch alarms and says, it's time to breathe. So apparently, I was way more into the movie than I thought. <laughs> I, Either that or you were holding your breath, hoping to die. Yeah. Hour and 20 minutes in, we see the reason for the random Chinese dam scene in the opener. It wasn't random at all. What? What? That thing you saw that you think didn't mean anything now comes over here and actually is a big thing. So you shouldn't have thought it wasn't a thing when you saw it the first time. That kind of thing. It's so dialed in. It was like, this is the amount of work that goes into seven MCU movies winding up at the same point. So there's a lot. There's a lot going on. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot going on. Maybe they should have taken seven movies. They maybe. Um, Since I can't swear. I will say uh, one hour and 24 minutes in, we see that Hawaii got bleep up. <laughs> Hawaii got Hawaii a, did not do so well. Hawaii got a stern talking to. Yes, stern, stern definitely, talking to. Definitely, yes. Uh, people getting smushed by the Washington Monument. 
that's pretty dope. Now my ticker's on the way up again. I'm like, I've always wanted to see the Washington Monument fall and kill like a thousand people. That was great. I am... I am taking you to task on that. There is zero chance that you have ever thought that any movie set in Washington would be made better by watching the Washington Monument fall apart. Uh, Got to be honest. Every time, <laughs> every time I see a presidential inauguration or a gathering or anything, and look at that big tower, I'm like, you know, if that tower just fell right on those people. That'd be kind of awesome. So dream, tr- dream come true. Dream come true. Um, <clears throat> and it, it's a great way for characters to die. I admit, one hour and 30 minutes in, this one's on me. I take full responsibility for this. I did not see the giant tsunamis coming. And of course there would be giant tsunamis. We've seen actual giant tsunamis for little earthquakes. Little bitty earthquakes out in the ocean, not the tectonic plates going. One hour and 33 minutes in, I'm getting pumped. My boy, Danny Glover, he cannot die. He is a badass. He's like, earthquake, don't give a crap. Tectonic shift, brush that off my shoulder. Ain't got no problem with that. There's ash all over the place. Whatever. I get up. I'm Danny Glover. I'm the boss. And then he got squashed by an aircraft carrier. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, so <laughs> that's gangster. Yeah. That is going out like a boss. And you're like, you know what? I didn't expect this from Roland Emmerich. And I didn't expect it. But I appreciate that any character is expendable. Yeah. Well, except our nuclear family, which... Yeah, well, but you would think that the President of the United States, who is also Danny Glover, yeah. would make it out alive. Didn't. 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 He got squashed by, air, <laughs> by an aircraft carrier. By an carry. aircraft carrier. He did get squashed by an aircraft carrier. To be fair, he looked up at that aircraft carrier, and you could tell what he was thinking. He was acting his little ass off. He was like, yeah, come on, bring it. Bring that aircraft carrier. He didn't wince. He didn't cry. He's like, this is the way it goes. What would you do? Would you put up your dukes? Uh, for an aircraft carrier, yeah. I would soil myself immediately. <laughs> okay, that's, I don't think he did One that. One and two, no question. That's happening right out of the so gate. So much for the family show. Right out of the gate. <laughs> then I have a brief moment to feel shame at doing that. Then I get squashed by an aircraft carrier. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay. So now, the, now my ticker's way up because watching a aircraft carrier fall in the White House, I'm excited. I'm in. I'm all the way into this movie. And then the writing comes back. One hour and 36 minutes in, there are billions of people dead. Society is gone. The mm-hmm. human race is on a beeline for extinction. Mm-hmm. And like, yes, now is the time for a little relationship chat. Yes. To kind of check in and see how we feel about each I other mean, as people. I mean, because, you know, we are human creatures and <clears throat> we crave human interaction, even in our entertainment. It's it's how Roland Emmerich makes this a character-driven story. It is. It is. And uh, so I, pa- I pause at 138 to write down... Are you kidding? The kid is now asking relationship questions. What is going on? And then I look at the timer on the bottom of the screen. And then I realize, I'm like, I'm a movie in. A whole 90-minute movie in. And there's another hour to go. More than an hour. I did not see that coming. I did not see that. The movie is two hours and 38 minutes. Two hours and 38 minutes. But if I ask you to give me the elevator pitch for this movie, it's impossible to do. Well, there's neutrinos and a whole bunch of coincidences and then a whole bunch of natural disasters cut and then there's many many government officials who all speak english and then the dog makes it yeah this movie is is what the youtube show movie pitch was made for barely an inconvenience uh how is he gonna get across the country that seems impossible not at all barely an inconvenience So he just runs into the guy at the airport and they know each other from before. He's like, yes, how does that happen? Don't know. Okay. It's <laughs> <he's> great. <clears throat> so at this point, hour and 47 minutes in, we've already had to break this up into two days. It's a two-day viewing. And I admit, I'm getting kind of excited to see what the arc looks like. I'm like, all right, give me the sci-fi. Like, we're going to blast off into space. Everything's going to be super dope. We'll go colonize the planet. I'm like, and find out what Wait the- a minute, wait a minute. Was the deal always to blast off into space? In my head. Oh, I was going to say, I didn't see that at all. In my head. They said arc, and I'm like, space arc. And like, because now I'm like, <laughs> in my head, I think this. I'm like, well, we've already seen the Earth get completely ripped a new one. There's billions of people dead. We got tsunamis, we got earthquakes, we got falling aircraft carriers. At this point, I'm like, and now I see why there's 60 minutes left, because they're going to have to show them landing on another planet. And I'm getting, I'm like, this is going to be dope. Where are they going to go? This is great. They got like a Mars thing. What's going on? Then comes the 1,500 kilometer high tidal wave. Yes. And I am not going to argue about the scientific validity of this. What I am going to see say is that's a 932 mile high wave of water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, I... It's a lot. 
I have actually been in 30 foot swells. Yep. Um, and they are terribly devastating. Yeah. And I think, so the cars were in the plane, so that was fine. Mm -hmm. But like, there's no, there's no being on the bridge. Yeah. There's no hanging out in any social area. Literally buckling in to you your bunk. When you were in 30 foot waves. Yes. Yes. And those are 30, well, they're 30 foot swells. So that's a, you know, a 60 total, yes. whatever. But, um, but still pretty devastating and could be very damaging. So a 932 mile high wave. Big. And it's absolutely big. would have tossed the, those arcs all around the new world sized ocean. Hey, you're being overly critical of this film. Oh, they, they totally took care of that. I will get to that. But then John Q. Second family arrives and sees the arcs and the kid's like, why do they have an anchor? And I'm like, God damn it. We don't even get off the planet? Oh, I love what? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, what? If, there's 32 minutes left in this goddamn thing. What is, what is going to happen now? And uh, they do deliver. This did feel like someone got the writers together in a writer room, and then they passed out like eight cases of Red Bull and did 27 lines of Coke and anything else that will pump people up and had people just throw out ideas like, well, well, what, if there's a, what if there's a thousand mile wave? Put it in the film. What if there's, uh, uh, what if the, what if an aircraft carrier squashes the president? It's in the <laughs> film, baby. Like anything they could throw out. Give this man a corner office. Give this man a corner <laughs> office. Because <laughs> there's stuff that's coming up that just, even I was like, bravo, bravo for, for going way out there. Um, two hours into the movie, sure, save the dog. Billions of human beings are dying, but let's raise everyone's spirits with a cute little quirky dog who walks along a rail and gets away. But here's the here's the the <clears throat> actual fantastic thing about that. Okay, there is this and this whole little denouement is so impossible, right? There's no chance that that giant hydraulic thing or what the gate lifting up all of that. There's no chance with 15 minutes until the end of the world, even John Cusack or anybody else. I know this is uh, this is Adrian who does this. Mm -hmm. I mean, we wouldn't be human. Yeah. OK, well, one, they pontificate for like four minutes. Yeah, There's 15 minutes till a 900 mile high wave of water hits them. And I said I couldn't help it. I like so they the first thing they do is they show us the clock that there's 15 minutes left for yes, 932 to catch you up, miles. Uh, John Cusack and his family um, almost make the human race extinct because they cheat and get on a boat they weren't supposed to be on and they muck it up on the way in. Mm -hmm. And then Adrian, and then because the gate's open, they can't start the engines on a boat, which is weird. You think they'd be compartmentalized. But anyways, they can't get the gate open. Wait, turns out it is carpet compartmentalized but not until later not till not that part yes and then because one boat is ruined the boat number three out of the seven boats is ruined those people are stuck on the dock and they spend 20 minutes melodramatically talking about whether we're still human if we let them on or not yeah and i was so by then i was so tapped out that was probably when i was like well it was good forethought that they put the Brought the whole orchestra up to the bridge yeah. to play the plinky music. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that was a, that's a rolling number film, though. A lot of melodrama, a lot of slow melodrama, why everybody's about to die. And then um, Gordon goes out hard, which is a bummer. He gets ground in wheels, Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom style. Definitely you know? does. And uh, I noticed that, uh, oh, hey, Amanda Pete switches gears real, real fast. Oh, yes. It's, it's, if, if I were, Anyone related to Amanda Peet, her ex-husband, not her dead, her new dead husband, mm -hmm. but her ex-husband or either one of her children, I'd be like, the, what just happened here? Yeah. Because this is creepy. Didn't you wake up out of bed with Gordon this morning? Yeah. 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 And now you are smooching on John Cusack, mm -hmm. which to be fair, he's very, he seems like a very nice man. For one minute to impact <clears throat> of this 930 mile high tidal wave or maybe it's not this big at this point it's as big as the Alps I don't know I can't keep track of it all somehow sweeps up Air Force One mm -hmm. and throws Air Force One into the arc of humanity into arc number four yes what are the odds <laughs> this goes back to the Adderall ridden writer's room hey 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 what if uh, it gets hit by a plane put it in the picture wait what about what if it's Air Force One? Oh my love goodness. it, yes. love it. Put it in the picture. You kids are brilliant. I love you all. Order a pizza and some more Coke. Like that's yeah. it. <laughs> it's absolutely it's going on going on this thing. So, well, Amanda Pete is macking on the new guy. She switches real quick, and then they they get a, they they get on their Battlestar Galacticas and they float away, mm. and then they run into a mountain, 
Well, no, they don't run into a mountain. They they run into is it Mount McKe- Everest? Ma- Mount Everest. Yeah. yeah, they run into the north face of Mount Everest, which is now at sea level. They run into Mount Everest. Yep. It's so ridiculous. Yeah. They were when they when they touched down when the plane crash touched down mm-hmm. and then they then they got out of that plane and somehow ended up on the ark. That was China. And I get that that it no question now, was China. I'm not a ge- geology expert. Is well, Mount Everest in China? No. Oh. And and also they talk about this is this is what? a good piece of plot that they do. They're like, wait a minute. When when the uh, the sexy Russian is flying and he's mm-hmm. like, wait, what? We're running out of gas. We're losing our engines. Oh, is that land? And there's a one sentence like, yes, with the Earth's everything mantle, shifted. everything, yeah, everything is coming that was, together. I was down for that. That was fun. Y- yes. That's still, okay, what about the enormous amount of land mass in between those two things? That would be a problem for me. Hey, it's like this. Let me explain some science to you. So you've got an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, right? And then say you fold it with three folds. So there's four panels. And then you bend the two panels together. On the outside, and they mm-hmm. touch. It's mm-hmm. like that. It's just like that. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it's not like that's science. It's not like Mount Hood in Washington, which would have been lots of water in the in between if they if it was coming one way, and uh-huh. obviously too much land mass in between. But I'm gonna say they should have maybe done a little. I mean, I don't know why I want more explaining out of this movie, but that would have been a little bit more helpful. Summing up the movie, the special effects were. Because worth actually, watching. Now, wait, wait a oh, minute. I might back to the movie. yeah. Because I, if I think about it, so. I still think it's because China is so big. I still think it's too much, but I, I think maybe Everest is. I know Everest is in Nepal, but I think it might border China. But okay. so, so that might have been more possible than I think now that I'm no longer watching that terrible movie. I see. But I still think your arc ship running into Mount Everest is ridiculous. After it shrugged off a direct assault from Air Force One, so we got that. True. Then we are in the uh, the Denimont stage, I think, as you call it, where everything's safe and they're they're on their little boats. Uh, the the romantic interest between the scientist and the president's daughter finally comes to fruition. Mm-hmm. And then they show two hours and twenty three minutes in, they're on the boat and they show they're in day twenty seven of year one. Yeah. And like, why would they restart the calendar? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense at all. You saved all this stuff from human culture and human artifacts, and now you're going to start at year one. Okay, crazy stuff. And, and that, that yeah. at that moment, took you out of this story. Yeah, I'm like, this is Which ridiculous. Is, is essentially made of magic. That anything could keep you in that story, so much so that something could take you out of the story, blows my mind. Well, I really like Battlestar Galactica, <laughs> as many people know. And there were four Battlestar Galactics all floating right by each other. So I'm like, That's I'm true. in. That's I'm in. I want point. a model of that. It looks great. That's a and good then point. everyone gets out of the Battlestar Galactica, walks around the deck. It's a sunny day. And then to finish the movie, to finish the movie, we're easily 7.6 billion people have died. The human race has been almost assuredly wiped out, although we find out Africa might not have been hit at quite as hard. Their way of ending the movie is by the last line of the movie is that the little girl who wet the bed doesn't wet the bed anymore. Yeah. Because she saw so much scary stuff. That it, whatever dreams aren't scary anymore. I'm like, this is how we end the movie. This, yeah, with uh, with no diapers. Also, <laughs> all right, I will give you that. I'm not even going to argue with you. You're correct. That's unfortunate. Mm-hmm. We hear earlier in the movie that they have been plotting and predicting this for at least two years. Yes. We watch them do it for yes. two years. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know what the scientist who figured out this whole thing was going to happen would have also flipping known? No. That Africa probably wouldn't get submerged. Oh, I, they have no idea. What, they they did establish that uh, the main scientist, the lead guy scientist, his predictions were wrong all over the place. His timetable was off. He was getting stuff wrong. It's an entire continent. So if every other piece of the Earth's crust moves, so would Africa. But they don't know how they're going to move. I, okay. You know what I know? I know a free-floating Africa is probably going to get wet. Okay, <clears throat> that's the uh, you're gonna die on that hill of Africa, which is now seven thousand feet higher than it was before. To be so that's fair, a good that's hill better to die than on. dying on a hill of diapers. And they did say this is the roof of the world now, Africa. Yes, they did say that. Yes. Uh, that is. Uh, do you have any final thoughts? I on mean, my only thought is. 
two things. Yes. These are general, fair general warnings for you and for the listeners and mm-hmm. for specifically any junkies who are going to help us pick other movies. Y'all, don't watch this movie. Oh, no. I don't want, watch no, this movie. No. And the other thing is... I want them I want them to suffer. I want them to watch it. No, watch this, please. No, don't watch it. There's no good reason to watch it. It's worse than you think. You know what this is like? This is like when I take a bite of something that's maybe not quite safe to eat anymore, and I'm like, oh, this is terrible. you got to taste this. Yep. It's the raccoons from the Bud Light commercial. It's you true, got, and I'm not going to taste, gonna taste it. You guys got to taste this movie. No. It's two hours and 30 no. minutes. If you have Netflix, it's free. And the second thing is... I would gladly pay you Tuesday for <laughs> picking a better movie next time. <laughs> well, we can't. It's the wheels of death. It, uh, yes, I didn't realize that was such a prophetic name. It was a prophetic name. It really was. And I'm going to guess this will not be the last time this happens no, to us. No, no. I'm nice to you, junkies. <laughs> I'm nice to you. Well, that finishes up our uh, love letter to Roland Emmerich's 20, 2012. Mm-hmm. Um, the world did not end. If the world had ended, this movie wouldn't have come out. No, it was before 2012. That's mm-hmm. a bummer. Yeah. So that is it for Story Smack. We're back on track with Sport Story Smack. Again, keep an eye at facebook.com slash Scott Sigler or on my Instagram. Right now, we're only doing Sigler in place as Facebook Live events, usually in a weekday, usually about 2 or 2.30. We do not have a schedule because I'm making stuff up as I go along. Mm-hmm. But what? like that page. Pay attention to that page. Facebook does make it very hard. We've got 23,000 people like the page and only a fraction of them get to see anything we put on. Right. Even yeah. though they've opted in. So yeah. we'll do the best we can. We don't have a schedule for this. We're just trying to bring, we're trying to do some fun stuff while mm-hmm. everybody's stuck at home, trying to keep costs down for that fun stuff. Yep. You know, and unless you want to buy a bunch of gold and pour it into a mold that you make that looks like my head and then send us the gold head. That's fine. I mean, that costs a lot of money, but you can do that if you want to. Also, we would just melt it down, right? Oh, are you crazy? It's a gold head made like me. We would never melt that down. Never. Never. Oh, okay. Never. So uh, we have another story smack in the hopper. Mm-hmm. Um, we recently watched a movie called Memory, The Origins of an Alien, which is a documentary about the movie Alien. Correct. And then following that, we watched the Alien Director's, director's Cut. Cut. Which is weird. It is weird, yes. And so I'm telling you the guys this now in case you want to get a little bit ahead. If you've seen Alien, you haven't seen Alien, you want to watch that. You, I really enjoyed Memory, the origin of an alien. That, but that wasn't on Netflix, right? That was it on, might not be, but so this is on Amazon isn't, Prime. It's exactly. Like three, four yeah. This is. A, I'm, so this will be in the hopper. We're not going to talk about it on Facebook Live, but it's likely to be the next uh, story smack that yes. we put out. Yes. Um, so if you guys are interested in watching that, like Scott says, it might cost you a little bit of money, but. We will be doing that story smack in the very near future. If you watch the director's cut of Alien, note that it says, uh, the streaming says it's three hours long, Mm -hmm. but it's not really. It's actually, there's three vignettes or featurettes or something at the end. So we discovered, I think, several things are true. There's that, the three vignettes at the end are part of the overall time signature. And also that you said that the movie itself has is about a minute shorter. It's a minute shorter than the theatrical version. And it has scenes pulled out and different scenes put in. Correct. So it's not like they just edited out a minute. They changed the They the changed film. it dramatically. Yeah. Dramatic. Yeah. So if you're a big fan of Alien, I was surprised. The director's cut uh, is internally consistent for the most part. Yep. Um, but I saw stuff I'd never seen. And it was fun because I'm like... I don't think, and like variations on scenes too. Like, I don't think that part was in the original one and I've seen the original one a lot. So from that perspective, it was fun and we will be talking about that when we do our next Story Smack. Which will be real soon. Real soon. Take care of yourselves, Junkie, and take care of each other. Thank you.